it's when you've decided to invest on your own that you ought to try going it alone. That means ignoring the hot tips, the recommendations from brokerage houses, and the latest can't-miss suggestion from your favorite newsletter in favor of your own research. It means ignoring the stocks that you hear Peter Lynch, or some similar authority, is buying. If you wanted an education in stocks, the golf course was the next best thing to being on the floor of a major exchange. Especially after they'd sliced or hooked a drive, club members enthusiastically described their latest triumphant investment. In a single round of play I might give out five golf tips and get back five stock tips in return. Though I had no funds to invest in stock tips, the happy stories I heard on the fairways made me rethink the family position that the stock market was a place to lose money. Many of my clients actually seemed to have made money in the stock market, and some of the positive evidence actually trickled down to me. In 1963, my sophomore year in college, I bought my first stock off Flying Tiger Airlines for $7 a share. Between the caddying and a scholarship I'd covered my tuition, living at home reduced my other expenses, and I had already upgraded myself from an $85 car to a $150 car. After all the tips that I'd had to ignore, I finally was rich enough to invest. Once the unsettling fact of the risk in money is accepted, we can begin to separate gambling from investing not by the type of activity, buying bonds, buying stocks, betting on the horses, etc., but by the skill, dedication, and enterprise of the participant. To a veteran handicapper with the discipline to stick to a system, betting on horses offers a relatively secure long-term return, which to him has been as reliable as owning a mutual fund, or shares in General Electric. Meanwhile, to the rash and impetuous stock picker who chases hot tips and rushes in and out of his equities, an investment in stocks is no more reliable than throwing away paychecks on the horse with the prettiest mane, or the jockey with the purple silks. In stage 4, once again they're crowded around Maya but this time it's to tell me what stocks I should buy. Even the dentist has 3 or 4 tips, and in the next few days I look up his recommendations in the newspaper and they've all gone up. When the neighbors tell me what to buy and then I wish I had taken their advice, it's a sure sign that the market has reached a top and is due for a tumble. Among amateur investors, for some reason it's not considered sophisticated practice to equate driving around town eating donuts with the initial phase of an investigation into equities. People seem more comfortable investing in something about which they are entirely ignorant. There seems to be an unwritten rule on Wall Street, if you don't understand it, then put your life savings into it. Shun the enterprise around the corner, which can at least be observed, and seek out the one that manufactures an incomprehensible product. If IBM goes bad and you bought it, the clients and the bosses will ask, what's wrong with that damn IBM lately? But if La Quinta Motor Inns goes bad, they'll ask, what's wrong with you? That's why security-conscious portfolio managers don't buy La Quinta Motor Inns when two analysts cover the stock and it sells for $3 a share. They don't buy Walmart when the stock sells for $4, and it's a dinky store in a dinky little town in Arkansas, but soon to expand. They buy Walmart when there's an outlet in every large population center in America, 50 analysts follow the company and the chairman of Walmart is featured in People magazine as the eccentric billionaire who drives a pickup truck to work. By then the stock sells for $40. It doesn't have to be a turnaround in sales that gets your attention. It may be that companies you know about have incredible hidden assets that don't show up on the balance sheet. If you work in real estate, maybe you know that a department store chain owns four city blocks in downtown Atlanta, carried on the books at pre-Civil War prices. This is a definite hidden asset, and similar opportunities might be found in gold, oil, timberland, and TV stations. Whereas Pebble Beach was an over-the-counter stock, Newhall Land and Farming was on the New York Stock Exchange and very visible while it went up well over 20-fold. The company had two significant properties, the Cowell Ranch in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the much larger and more valuable Newhall Ranch, 30 miles north of downtown Los Angeles. The Newhall Ranch has a planned community complete with an amusement park, a large industrial office complex, and it is developing a major shopping mall. I once visited a mundane little Florida cattle company called Alico, 
run out of La Belle, a small town at the edge of the Everglades. All I saw there was scrub pine and palmetto brush, a few cows grazing around, and perhaps twenty Alaco employees trying unsuccessfully to look busy. It wasn't very exciting, until you figured out that you could have bought Alaco for under twenty dollars a share, and ten years later the land alone turned out to be worth more than two hundred dollars a share. A smart codger named Ben Hill Griffin, Jr., kept buying up the stock and waiting for Wall Street to notice Alaco. He must have made a fortune by now. It's hard to think of a more perfect industry than waste management. If there's anything that disturbs people more than animal casings, grease, and dirty oil, it's sewage and toxic waste dumps. That's why I got very excited one day when the solid waste executives showed up in my office. They had come to town for a solid waste convention complete with booths and slides so imagine how attractive that must have been. Anyway, instead of the usual blue cotton button-down shirts that I see day after day, they were wearing polo shirts that said solid waste. Who would put on shirts like that, unless it was the solid waste bowling team? These are the kind of executives you dream about. For several years this Houston-based enterprise has been going around the country buying up local funeral homes from the mom-and-pop owners, just as Gannett did with the small-town newspapers. Psy has become a sort of McBurial. It has picked up the active funeral parlors that bury a dozen or more people a week, ignoring the smaller one or two burial parlors. Certainly, owning a rock pit is safer than owning a jewelry business. If you're in the jewelry business, you're competing with other jewelers from across town, across the state, and even abroad, since vacationers can buy jewelry anywhere and bring it home. But if you've got the only gravel pit in Brooklyn, you've got a virtual monopoly, plus the added protection of the unpopularity of rock pits. What makes a rock pit valuable is that nobody else can compete with it. The nearest rival owner from two towns over isn't going to haul his rocks into your territory because the trucking bills would eat up all his profit. No matter how good the rocks are in Chicago, no Chicago rock pit owner can ever invade your territory in Brooklyn or Detroit. Due to the weight of rocks, aggregates are an exclusive franchise. You don't have to pay a dozen lawyers to protect it. Legs is the perfect example of the power of common knowledge. It turned out to be one of the two most successful consumer products of the 70s. In the early part of that decade, before I took over Fidelity Magellan, I was working as a securities analyst at the firm. I knew the textile business from having traveled the country visiting textile plants, calculating profit margins, price-slash-earnings ratios, and the esoterica of warps and woofs. But none of this information was as valuable as Carolyn's. I didn't find legs in my research, she found it by going to the grocery store. By asking some basic questions about companies, you can learn which are likely to grow and prosper, which are unlikely to grow and prosper, and which are entirely mysterious. You can never be certain what will happen, but each new occurrence a jump in earnings, the sale of an unprofitable subsidiary, the expansion into new market saw is like turning up another card. As long as the cards suggest favorable odds of success, you stay in the hand. In this section we'll discuss how to exploit an edge, how to find the most promising investments, how to evaluate what you own and what you can expect to gain in each of six different categories of stocks, the characteristics of the perfect company, the characteristics of companies that should be avoided at all costs, the importance of earnings to the eventual success or failure of any stock the questions to ask in researching a stock, how to monitor a company's progress, how to get the facts, and how to evaluate the important benchmarks, such as cash, debt, price-slash-earning ratios, profit margins, book value, dividends, etc. You don't have to be Steven Spielberg to know that some new blockbuster, or string of blockbusters, is going to give a significant boost to the earnings of Paramount or Orion Pictures. You could be an actor, an extra, a director, a stuntman, a lawyer, a gaffer, the makeup person, or the usher at a local cinema, where the standing room only crowds six weeks in a row inspire you to investigate the pros and cons of investing in Orion's stock. How about automatic data processing, 
which processes 9 million paychecks a week for 180,000 small and medium-sized companies. This has been one of the all-time great opportunities, the company went public in 1961 and has increased earnings every year without a lapse. The worst it ever did was to earn 11% more than the previous year, and that was during the 1982A83 recession when many companies reported losses. It might be a service industry, the property casualty insurance business, or even the book business where you can spot a turnaround. Buyers and sellers of any product notice shortages and gluts, price changes, and shifts in demand. Such information isn't very valuable in the auto industry, since car sales are reported every 10 days. Wall Street is obsessed with cars. But in most other endeavors the grassroots observer can spot a turnaround 6 to 12 months ahead of the regular financial analysts. This gives an incredible head start in anticipating an improvement in earnings and earnings as you'll see, make stock prices go higher. Fidelity isn't a public company, so you couldn't invest in the rush here. But what about Dreyfus? Want to see a chart that doesn't stop? The stock sold for 40 cents a share in 1977, then nearly $40 a share in 1986, a 100 bagger in 9 years, and much of that during a lousy stock market. Franklin was a 138 bagger and Federated was up 50-fold before it was bought out by Aetna. I was right on top of all of them. I knew the Dreyfus story, the Franklin story, and the Federated story from beginning to end. Everything was right, earnings were up, the momentum was obvious, see chart. But on the strength of Pampers alone, should you have rushed out to buy the stock? Not if you'd begun to develop the story. Then, in about five minutes, you would have noticed that Procter & Gamble is a huge company and that Pampers sales contribute only a small part of the earnings. Pampers made some difference to Procter & Gamble, but it wasn't nearly as consequential as what Legs did for a smaller outfit such as Haynes. Keeping track of the growth rates of industry is an industry in itself. There are endless charts, tables, and comparisons. With individual companies it's a little trickier. Since growth can be measured in various ways, growth in sales, growth in profits, growth in earnings, etc. But when you hear about a growth company, you can assume that it's expanding. There are more sales, more production, and more profits in each successive year. This doesn't mean that by paying a dividend the corporate directors are doing the wrong thing. In many cases it may be the best use to which the company's earnings can be put. See Chapter 13 You won't find a lot of 2-4% to 4 growers in my portfolio, because if companies aren't going anywhere fast, neither will the price of their stocks. If growth in earnings is what enriches a company, then what's the sense of wasting time on sluggards? Stalwarts are companies such as Coca-Cola, Bristol-Myers, Procter & Gamble, the Bell Telephone Sisters, Hershey's, Ralston Purina, and Colgate Palmolive. These multi-billion dollar hulks are not exactly agile climbers, but they're faster than slow growers. As you can see in the chart of Procter & Gamble, it's not as flat as the map of Delaware, but it's no Everest, either. When you traffic in stalwarts, you're more or less in the foothills, 10-12% to 12 annual growth in earnings. The same thing happened to Taco Bell in the fast food business, Walmart in the general store business, and the gap in the retail clothing business. These upstart enterprises learn to succeed in one place, and then to duplicate the winning formula over and over, mall by mall, city by city. The expansion into new markets results in the phenomenal acceleration in earnings that drives the stock price to giddy heights. I'll have more to say about diversification later and most of it unflattering. The only positive aspect is that some companies that diversify themselves into sorry shape are future candidates for turnarounds. Goodyear is coming back right now. It's gotten out of the oil business, sold off some sluggish subsidiaries, and rededicated itself to the thing it does best, making tires. Merck, having washed its hands of Calgon and a few other minor distractions, is once again concentrating on its ethical drugs. It has four new drugs in clinical trials and two that have passed FDA approval, and the earnings are picking up. A company that does boring things is almost as good as a company that has a boring name, 
and both together is terrific. Both together is guaranteed to keep the oxymorons away until finally the good news compels them to buy in, thus sending the stock price even higher. If a company with terrific earnings and a strong balance sheet also does dull things, it gives you a lot of time to purchase the stock at a discount. Then when it becomes trendy and overpriced, you can sell your shares to the trend followers. Safety Clean hasn't rested on the spoils of greasy auto parts. It has since branched out into restaurant grease traps and other sorts of messes. What analyst would want to write about this, and what portfolio manager would want to have Safety Clean on his buy list? There aren't many, which is precisely what's endearing about Safety Clean. Like automatic data processing, this company has had an unbroken run of increased earnings. Profits have gone up every quarter, and so has the stock. Largely as a result of these acquisitions, the earnings increased from $0.34 cents a share in 1985 to $2 a share in 1987A and should top $2.50 in 1988. The company has used its substantial cash flow to pay down its debt on the various acquisitions. I bought it for $3 a share in September, 1985. At the high in 1988 it sold $4.367 slash 8. Large parent companies do not want to spin off divisions and then see those spin offs get into trouble, because that would bring embarrassing publicity that would reflect back on the parents. Therefore, the spin offs normally have strong balance sheets and are well prepared to succeed as independent entities. And once these companies are granted their independence, the new management, free to run its own show, can cut costs and take creative measures that improve the near term and long term earnings. Once liberated, the seven regional companies were able to increase earnings, cut costs, and enjoy higher profits. They got all the local and regional telephone business, the yellow pages, along with 50 cents for every $1 of long-distance business generated by ATT. It was a great niche. They had already gone through an earlier period of heavy spending on modern equipment, so they didn't have to dilute shareholders' equity by selling extra stock. And human nature being what it is, the seven baby bells set up a healthy competition amongst themselves, and also between themselves and their proud parent, Ma Bell. Ma, meanwhile, was losing its stranglehold on its highly profitable leased equipment business, and facing new competitors such as Sprint and MCI, and sustaining heavy losses in its computer operations. Maybe the rumors of the mafia in waste management kept away the same investors who worried about the mafia in hotel-slash-casino management. Remember the dreaded casino stocks that are now on everybody's buy list? Respectable investors weren't supposed to touch them because the casinos allegedly were all mafia. Then the earnings exploded and the profits exploded, and the mafia faded into the background. When Holiday Inn and Hilton got into the casino business, it suddenly was all right to own casino stocks. The best thing about this company is that it was shunned by most professional investors for years. Despite an incredible record, the Psy executives had to go out on cavalcades to beg people to listen to their story. That meant that amateurs in the know could buy stock in a proven winner with a record of solid growth in earnings, and at much lower prices than they'd have to pay for a hot stock in a popular industry. Here was the perfect opportunity yeah, everything was working, you could see it happening, the earnings kept increasing, there was rapid growth with almost no data and Wall Street turned the other way. Any reporter, ad executive, or editor who worked at the Washington Post could have seen the profits and the earnings and understood the value of the niche. A newspaper company is a great business for a variety of reasons as well. Instead of investing in computer companies that struggle to survive in an endless price war, why not invest in a company that benefits from the price war such as automatic data processing? As computers get cheaper, automatic data can do its job cheaper and thus increase its own profits. Or instead of investing in a company that makes automatic scanners, why not invest in the supermarkets that install the scanners? If a scanner helps a supermarket company cut costs just 3%, that alone might double the company's earnings. When stock is bought in by the company, it is taken out of circulation, therefore shrinking the number of outstanding shares. This can have a magical effect on earnings per share, which in turn has a magical effect on the stock price. 
if a company buys back half its shares and its overall earnings stay the same, the earnings per share have just doubled. Few companies could get that kind of result by cutting costs or selling more widgets. This sensible practice was almost unheard of until quite recently. Back in the 1960s, International Dairy Queen was one of the pioneers in share buybacks, but there were few others who followed suit. At the delightful Crown, Cork, and Seal they've bought back shares every year for the last 20. They never pay a dividend, and they never make unprofitable acquisitions, but by shrinking shares they've gotten the maximum impact from the earnings. If this keeps up, someday there will be a thousand shares of Crown, Cork, and Seal a worth $10 million apiece. The reverse of buying back shares is adding more shares, also called diluting. International Harvester, now Navy Star, sold millions of additional shares to raise cash to help it survive a financial crisis brought about by the collapse of the farm equipment business, see chart. Chrysler, remember, did just the opposite of buying back stock and stock warrants and shrinking the number of outstanding shares as the business improved, see chart. Navy Star is once again a profitable company, but because of the extraordinary dilution, the earnings have a minimal impact, and shareholders have yet to benefit from the recovery to any significant degree. I hear about Cajun from a distant relative who swears it's the only way to get mildew off leather jackets left too long in dank closets. I do some research and discover that Cajun has had a 20% growth rate in earnings for the past four years, it's never had a down quarter there's no debt on the balance sheet, and it did well in the last recession. I visit the company and find out that any trained crustacean could oversee the making of the gel. With survival at stake, it's the rare professional who has the guts to traffic in an unknown La Quinta. In fact, between the chance of making an unusually large profit on an unknown company and the assurance of losing only a small amount on an established company, the normal mutual fund manager, pension fund manager, or corporate portfolio manager would jump at the latter. Success is one thing, but it's more important not to look bad if you fail. There's an unwritten rule on Wall Street, you'll never lose your job losing your client's money in IBM. Can't think of any such opportunity in your own life? What if you're retired, live 10 miles from the nearest traffic light, grow your own food, and don't have a television set? Well, maybe one day you have to go to a doctor. The rural existence has given you ulcers, which is the perfect introduction to Smith Klein Beckman. Before you think about buying stocks, you ought to have made some basic decisions about the market, about how much you trust corporate America, about whether you need to invest in stocks and what you expect to get out of them, about whether you are a short or long term investor, and about how you will react to sudden, unexpected, and severe drops in price. It's best to define your objectives and clarify your attitudes, do I really think stocks are riskier than bonds, beforehand, because if you are undecided and lack conviction, then you are a potential market victim, who abandons all hope and reason at the worst moment and sells out at a loss. It is personal preparation, as much as knowledge and research, that distinguishes the successful stock picker from the chronic loser. Ultimately it is not the stock market nor even the companies themselves that determine an investor's fate. It is the investor. My biggest disadvantage is size. The bigger the equity fund, the harder it gets for it to outperform the competition. Expecting a $9 billion fund to compete successfully against an $800 million fund is the same as expecting Larry Bird to star in basketball games with a 5-pound weight strapped to his waist. Big funds have the same built-in handicaps as big anything so the bigger it is, the more energy it takes to move it. Yet even at $9 billion, Fidelity Magellan has continued to compete successfully. Every year some new soothsayer says it can't go on like this, and every year so far it has. Since June, 1985, when Magellan became the country's largest fund, it has outperformed 98% of general equity mutual funds. Even blue-chip stocks held long-term, supposedly the safest of all propositions, can be risky. RCA was a famous prudent investment, and suitable for widows and orphans, yet it was bought out by GE in 1986 for $66.50 a share, about the same price that it traded in 1967, 
and only 74% above its 1929 high of $38.25, adjusted for splits. Less than 1% worth of annual appreciation is all you got in 57 years of sticking with a solid, world-famous, and successful company. Bethlehem Steel continues to sell far below its high of $60 a share reached in 1958. Since the stock market is in some way related to the general economy, one way that people try to outguess the market is to predict inflation and recessions, booms and busts, and the direction of interest rates. True, there is a wonderful correlation between interest rates and the stock market, but who can foretell interest rates with any bankable regularity? There are 60,000 economists in the U.S., many of them employed full-time trying to forecast recessions and interest rates, and if they could do it successfully twice in a row, they'd all be millionaires by now. True, true. You don't necessarily have to know anything about a company for its stock to go up. But the important point is that, 1. The oil experts, on average, are in a better position than doctors to decide when to buy or to sell Schlumberger, and, 2. The doctors, on average, know better than oil experts when to invest in a successful drug. The person with the edge is always in a position to outguess the person without an edge a who after all will be the last to learn of important changes in a given industry. Here is a company that has done everything right a made sensible acquisitions, cut costs, developed successful new products, rid itself of bumbling subsidiaries, avoided getting suckered into the computer business, after selling its mistake to Honeywell, a and still the stock inches along. That's not GE's fault. The stock can't help but inch along since it's attached to such a huge enterprise. Electric utilities are today's most popular slow growers, but throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s the utilities were fast growers, expanding at over twice the rate of GNP. They were successful companies and great stocks. As people installed central air conditioning, bought big refrigerators slash freezers, and generally ran up their electric bills, electricity consumption became a high-growth industry, and the major utilities, particularly in the Sun Belt, expanded at double-digit rates. In the 1970s, as the cost of power rose sharply, consumers learned to conserve electricity, and the utilities lost their momentum. Turnaround stocks make up lost ground very quickly, as Chrysler, Ford, Penn Central, General Public Utilities, and numerous others have proven. The best thing about investing in successful turnarounds is that of all the categories of stocks, their ups and downs are least related to the general market. There's the perfectly good company inside a bankrupt company kind of turnaround, such as Toys R Us. Once Toys R Us was spun out on its own, away from its less successful parent, Interstate Department Stores, the result was 57 bags. The beauty of legs is that you didn't have to know about it from the outset. You could have bought Haynes stock the first year, the second year, or even the third year after legs went nationwide and you'd have tripled your money at least. But a lot of people didn't, especially husbands. Husbands, usually also known as the designated investors, probably were too busy buying solar energy stocks or satellite dish company stocks and losing their collective shirts. Houndstooth's wife Henrietta also known as the person who doesn't understand the serious business of money, these roles could be reversed, but usually aren't, A has just returned from the shopping mall where she's discovered a wonderful new women's apparel store called The Limited. The place is mobbed with customers. She can't wait to tell her husband about the friendly salespeople and the terrific bargains. I bought Jennifer's entire fall wardrobe, she exclaims. Only $275. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Houndstooth, the stock price of the Limited, the store that impressed his wife, Henrietta, has been moving steadily higher, from less than 50 cents a share, adjusted for splits, in December, 1979, to $9 in 1983A already a 20 bagger to there and even if he'd bought it at the $9 price, and suffered through one drop back to $5 he'd have made more than five times his money as the stock soared to $5.27-8. That's over a 100 bagger from the beginning, so if Houndstooth had invested $10,000 early enough, he would have made over a million dollars on the stock. 
All my failures notwithstanding, during the 12 years I've managed Fidelity Magellan, it has risen over 20-fold per share a partly thanks to some of the little-known and out-of-favor stocks I've been able to discover and then research on my own. I'm confident that any investor can benefit from the same tactics. It doesn't take much to outsmart the smart money, which, as I've said, isn't always very smart. Fidelity had done such a good job selling America on mutual funds that even my mother was putting $100 a month into Fidelity Capital. That fund, run by Gary Tsai, was one of the two famous go-go funds of this famous go-go era. The other was Fidelity Trend, run by Edward C. Johnson III, also known as Ned. Ned Johnson was the son of the fabled Edward C. Johnson II, also known as Mr. Johnson, who founded the company. I also found it difficult to integrate the efficient market hypothesis, that everything in the stock market is known and prices are always rational, with the random walk hypothesis, that the ups and downs of the market are irrational and entirely unpredictable. Already I'd seen enough odd fluctuations to doubt the rational part, and the success of the great fidelity fund managers was hardly unpredictable. Soon enough I became known as the Will Rogers of equities the man who never saw a stock he didn't like. They're always making jokes about it in Baron S.A. Can you name one stock that Lynch doesn't own? Since I own 1,400 at present, I suppose they have a point. Certainly I can name plenty of stocks I wish I hadn't owned. The Limited is a good example of what I call street lag. When the company went public in 1969, it was all but unknown to the large institutions and the big-time analysts. The underwriter of the offering was a small firm called Verco & Co., located in Columbus, Ohio, where the headquarters of the Limited can also be found. Peter Halliday, a high school classmate of Limited chairman Leslie Wexner, was Verco's sales manager back then. Halliday attributed the disinterest of Wall Street to the fact that Columbus, Ohio, was not exactly a corporate mecca at the time. The long-term inflation rate as measured by the Consumer Price Index, is 3% a year, which gives common stocks a real return of 6.8% a year. The real return on Treasury bills, known as the most conservative and sensible of all places to put money, has been nil. That's right. Zippo. Municipal bonds are thought to be as secure as cash in a strongbox, but on the rare occasion of a default, don't tell the losers that bonds are safe. The best-known default is that of the Washington Public Power Supply System, and their infamous whoops bonds. Yes, I know bonds pay off in 99.9% .9 of the cases, but there are other ways to lose money on bonds besides a default. Try holding on to a 30-year bond with a 6% coupon during a period of raging inflation, and see what happens to the value of the bond. It's no accident that people who are geniuses in their houses are idiots in their stocks. A house is entirely rigged in the homeowner's favor. The banks let you acquire it for 20% down and in some cases less, giving you the remarkable power of leverage. True, you can buy stocks with 50% cash down, which is known in the trade as buying on margin, but every time a stock bought on margin drops in price, you have to put up more cash. That doesn't happen with a house. You never have to put up more cash if the market value goes down even if the house is located in the depressed oil patch. The real estate agent never calls at midnight to announce, you'll have to come up with $20,000 by 11 a.m. tomorrow or else sell off two bedrooms, which frequently happens to stockholders forced to sell their shares bought on margin. This is another great advantage to owning a house. The officers and employees of 180,000 client firms could certainly have known about the success of automatic data processing and since many of Automatic Data's biggest and best customers are major brokerage houses, so could half of Wall Street. Cyclicals are the most misunderstood of all the types of stocks. It is here that the unwary stock picker is most easily parted from his money, and in stocks that he considers safe. Because the major cyclicals are large and well-known companies, they are naturally lumped together with the trusty stalwarts. Since Ford is a blue chip, one might assume that it will behave the same as Bristol Myers, another blue chip, see charts. But this is far from the truth. 
Ford's stock fluctuates wildly as the company alternately loses billions of dollars in recessions and makes billions of dollars in prosperous stretches. If a stalwart such as Bristol Myers can lose half its value in a sorry market and slash or a national economic slump, a cyclical such as Ford can lose 80%. That's just what happened to Ford in the early 1980s. You have to know that owning Ford is different from owning Bristol Myers. The greatest spin-offs of all were the Baby Bell companies that were created in the breakup of ATT, Ameritech, Bell Atlantic, Bell South, 9X, Pacific Telesis, Southwestern Bell, and US West. While the parent has been an uninspiring performer, the average gain from stock in the seven newly created companies was 114% from November, 1983, to October, 1988. Add in the dividends and the total return is more like 170%. This beats the market twice around, and it beats the majority of all known mutual funds, including the one run by yours truly. I've always believed that investors should ignore the ups and downs of the market. Fortunately the vast majority of them paid little heed to the distractions cited above. If this is any example, Less than 3% of the million account holders in Fidelity Magellan switched out of the fund and into a money market fund during the desperations of the week. When you sell in desperation, you always sell cheap. I'm not going to get carried away and advise you to sell all your mutual funds. If that started to happen on any large scale, I'd be out of a job. Besides, there's nothing wrong with mutual funds, especially the ones that are profitable to the investor. Honesty and not immodesty compels me to report that millions of amateur investors have been well rewarded for investing in Fidelity Magellan, which is why I was invited to write this book in the first place. The mutual fund is a wonderful invention for people who have neither the time nor the inclination to test their wits against the stock market, as well as for people with small amounts of money to invest who seek diversification. You may have thought that a 10-bagger can only happen with some wild penny stock in some weird company like Braino Biofeedback or Cosmic R&D, the kind of stock that sensible investors avoid. Actually there are numerous 10-baggers in companies you'll recognize, Dunkin' Donuts, Walmart, Toys R Us, Stop and & Shop, and Subaru, to mention a few. These are companies whose products you've admired and enjoyed. But who would have suspected that if you'd bought the Subaru stock along with the Subaru car, you'd be a millionaire today? Yet it's true. This serendipitous calculation is based on several assumptions, first, that you bought the stock at its low of $2 a share in 1977, second, that you sold at the high in 1986, which would have amounted to $312 a share, unadjusted for an 8 for 1 split asterisk that's a 156 bagger and the fiscal equivalent of 39 home runs, so if you'd invested $6,410 in the stock, certainly in the price range of a car, you'd come out with $1 million exactly. Instead of owning a battered trade-in, you'd now have enough money to be able to afford a mansion and a couple of Jaguars in the garage. You would have been unlikely to make a million dollars by investing as much in Dunkin' Donuts stock as you spent on the donut saw how many donuts can a person eat? But if along with the two dozen donuts you bought every week for a year in 1982, a $270 total outlay, you had invested an equal amount in shares, then four years later the shares would have been worth $1,539, a six-bagger. A $10,000 investment in Dunkin' Donuts would have resulted in a $47,000 gain in four years. There's a famous story about a fireman from New England. Apparently back in the 1950s he couldn't help noticing that a local Tam Brown's plant, then the company was called Tampax, was expanding at a furious pace. It occurred to him that they wouldn't be expanding so fast unless they were prospering, and on that assumption he and his family invested $2,000. Not only that, they put in another $2,000 each year for the next five years. By 1972 the fireman was a millionaire and he hadn't even bought any Subaru. How many women who bought pantyhose, store clerks who saw the women buying pantyhose, and husbands who saw the women coming home with the pantyhose knew about the success of legs? Millions. Two or three years after the product was introduced, you could have walked into any one of thousands of supermarkets and realized that this was a bestseller. From there, 
it was easy enough to find out that Legs was made by Haynes and that Haynes was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. As I look back on it now, it's obvious that studying history and philosophy was much better preparation for the stock market than, say, studying statistics. Investing in stocks is an art, not a science, and people who've been trained to rigidly quantify everything have a big disadvantage. If stock picking could be quantified, you could rent time on the nearest Cray computer and make a fortune. But it doesn't work that way. All the math you need in the stock market, Chrysler's got $1 billion in cash, $500 million in long-term debt, etc., you get in the fourth grade. Fidelity Magellan had $20 million in assets. There were only 40 stocks in the portfolio, and Ned Johnson, Fidelity's head man, recommended that I reduce the number to 25. I listened politely and then went out and raised the number to 60 stocks, six months later to 100 stocks, and soon after that, to 150 stocks. I didn't do it to be contrary. I did it because when I saw a bargain I couldn't resist buying it, and in those days there were bargains everywhere. George Soros and Jimmy Rogers made their millions by taking esoteric positions I couldn't begin to explain a shorting gold, buying puts, hedging Australian bonds. And Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of them all, looks for the same sorts of opportunities I do, except that when he finds them, he buys the whole company. Let's say you manage a $1 billion pension fund, and to guard against diverse performance, you're required to choose from a list of 40 approved stocks, via the inspected by 4 method. Since you're only allowed to invest 5% of your total stake in each stock, you've got to buy at least 20 stocks, with $50 million in each. The most you can have is 40 stocks, with $25 million in each. In that case you have to find companies where $25 million will buy less than 10% of the outstanding shares. That cuts out a lot of opportunities, especially in the small fast-growing enterprises that tend to be the 10 beggars. For instance, you couldn't have bought Seven Oaks International or Dunkin' Donuts under these rules. Some funds are further restricted with a market capitalization rule, they don't own a stock in any company below, say, a dollar 100 million size. Size is measured by multiplying the number of outstanding shares by the current stock price. A company with 20 million shares outstanding that sell for $1.75 a share has a market cap of $35 million and must be avoided by the fund. But once the stock price has tripled to $5.25, that same company has a market cap of $105 million and suddenly it's suitable for purchase. This results in a strange phenomenon, large funds are allowed to buy shares in small companies only when the shares are no bargain. Traditionally bonds were sold in large denominations saw too large for the small investor, who could only invest in debt via the savings account, or the boring U.S. savings bonds. Then the bond funds were invented, and regular people could invest in debt right along with tycoons. After that, the money market fund liberated millions of former passbook savers from the captivity of banks, once and for all. There ought to be a monument to Bruce Bent and Harry Brown who dreamed up the money market account and dared to lead the great exodus out of the Scrooge and Thrifts. They started it with the reserve fund in 1971. Over time, the risks in the stock market can be reduced by proper play just as the risks in stud poker are reduced. With improper play, buying a stock that's overpriced, even the purchase of Bristol Myers or Heinz can result in huge losses and wasted opportunities, as I've said. It happens to people who imagine that betting with blue chips relieves them of the need to pay attention, so they lose half their money in quick fashion and may not recoup it for another eight years. In the early 1970s millions of uninformed dollars chased overpriced opportunities and soon disappeared as a result. Does that make Bristol Myers and McDonald's risky investments? Only because of the way people invested in them. How many times have you heard a friend or an acquaintance lament? I'm a lousy investor in my house. I'd bet it's not often. Millions of real estate amateurs have invested brilliantly in their houses. There are sometimes families that must move quickly and are forced to sell at a loss, but it's the rare individual who manages to lose money on a string of residences one after another, 
the way it routinely happens with stocks. It's a rarer individual yet who gets wiped out on a house, waking up one morning to discover that the premises have declared bankruptcy or turned belly up, which is the sad fate of many equities. Buffett has turned his Berkshire Hathaway into an extraordinarily profitable enterprise. In the early 1960s it cost $7 to buy a share in his great company, and that same share is worth $4,900 today. A $2,000 investment in Berkshire Hathaway back then has resulted in a 700-bagger that's worth $1.4 million today. That makes Buffett a wonderful investor. What makes him the greatest investor of all time is that during a certain period when he thought stocks were grossly overpriced, he sold everything and returned all the money to his partners at a sizable profit to them. The voluntary returning of money that others would gladly pay you to continue to manage is, in my experience, unique in the history of finance. Hundreds of doctors, thousands of patients, and millions of friends and relatives of patients heard about the wonder drug Tagamet, which came on the market in 1976. So did the pharmacist who dispensed the pills and the delivery boy who spent half his workday delivering them. Tagamet was a boon for the afflicted, and a bonanza for investors. So what happens? Johnson & Johnson stock jumps $8 a share in two days, January 2 1 a 22, 1988, which adds $1.4 billion in extra market value to the company. In all this hoopla the buyers must have forgotten to notice that the previous year's sales of Redden A brought in only $30 million a year to Johnson & Johnson, and the company still faced further FDA review on the new claims. In another case, which happened about the same time, investors did better homework. A new medical study reported that an aspirin every other day might reduce the risk of men's getting heart attacks. The study used the Bufferin brand of aspirin made by Bristol Myers, but Bristol Myers stock hardly budged, moving up just 50 cents per share to $4.27/8. A lot of people must have realized that domestic Bufferin sales last year were $75 million less than 1.5% of Bristol Myers's total revenues of $5.3 billion. GE has 900 million shares outstanding, and a total market value of $39 billion. The annual profit, more than $3 billion, is enough to qualify as a Fortune 500 company on its own. There is simply no way that GE could accelerate its growth very much without taking over the world. And since fast growth propels stock prices, it's no surprise that GE moves slowly as La Quinta soars. In the market we've had since 1980 the stalwarts have been good performers, but not the star performers. Most of these are huge companies, and it's unusual to get a ten-bagger out of a Bristol Myers or a Coca-Cola. So if you own a stalwart like Bristol Myers and the stock's gone up 50% in a year or two, you have to wonder if maybe that's enough and begin to think about selling. How much can you expect to squeeze out of Colgate Palmolive? You aren't going to become a millionaire off it the way you could have with Subaru, unless there is some startling new development you would have heard about by now. Pounds of material were sent out to the 2.96 million ATT shareholders explaining the Baby Bell's plans. The new companies laid out exactly what they were going to do. A million employees of ATT and countless suppliers could have seen what was going on. So much for the amateur's edge being restricted to a lucky few. For that matter, anyone who had a phone knew that there were big changes going on. I participated in the rally, but only in a modest way I never dreamed that conservative companies such as these could do so well so quickly. Psy gets the money from its pre-need sales right away, and the cash just keeps on compounding. If they sell $50 million worth of these policies each year, it will add up to billions by the time they've had all the funerals. Lately they've gone beyond their own operations to offer the pre-need policies to other funeral homes. Over the past five years the sales of pre-arranged funerals have been climbing at 40% a year. There's nothing thrilling about a thrilling high-growth industry, except watching the stocks go down. Carpets in the 1950s, electronics in the 1960s, computers in the 1980s, were all exciting high-growth industries, in which numerous major and minor companies unerringly failed to prosper for long. That's because for every single product in a hot industry, 
there are a thousand MIT graduates trying to figure out how to make it cheaper in Taiwan. As soon as a computer company designs the best word processor in the world, ten other competitors are spending $100 million to design a better one, and it will be on the market in eight months. This doesn't happen with bottle caps, coupon clipping services, oil drum retrieval, or motel chains. Although it's a nice gesture for the CEO or the corporate president with the million-dollar salary to buy a few thousand shares of the company stock, it's more significant when employees at the lower echelons add to their positions. If you see someone with a $45,000 annual salary buying $10,000 worth of stock, you can be sure it's a meaningful vote of confidence. That's why I'd rather find seven vice presidents buying 1,000 shares apiece than the president buying 5,000. The company is also planning to offer lifetime Prestane insurance to millions of Americans, who can pay in advance for a guaranteed removal of all the future stain accidents they ever cause. A fortune in off-balance sheet revenue will soon be pouring in. Once Carolyn alerted me to Haynes, I did the customary research into the story. The story was even better than I'd thought, so with the same confidence as the fireman who bought Tambrans, I recommended the stock to Fidelity's portfolio managers. Haynes turned out to be a six-bagger before it was taken over by Consolidated Foods, now Sarah Lee. Legs still makes a lot of money for Sarah Lee and has grown consistently over the past decade. I'm convinced Haynes would have been a 50-bagger if it hadn't been bought out. The rest of the story is easy to imagine. Winchester Disk Drives has a bad quarter, or there's unexpected competition in the disk drive industry, and the stock price drops from $10 to $5. Since the designated investor has no possible way to understand what any of this means, he decides the prudent thing is to sell out, delighted that he only lost another $1,500A or a little more than five sets of Jennifer's wardrobes. Funny thing, he mutters one day to his wife. Remember that store you like, the Limited? Turns out to be a public company. That means we can buy the stock. Pretty good stock, to boot, judging by the special I just saw on PBS. I heard Forbes even had a cover story on it. Anyway, the smart money can't get enough of it. Gotta be worth at least a couple of thousand from the retirement fund. I'm a fine one to chide Houndstooth for missing the limited. I didn't buy any shares on the way up, either, and my wife saw the same crowds at the shopping mall as his wife did. I, too, bought into the limited when the story got popular and the fundamentals had begun to deteriorate, and I'm still holding on at a loss. There's no such thing as a hereditary knack for picking stocks. Though many would like to blame their losses on some inbred tragic flaw, believing somehow that others are just born to invest, my own history refutes it. There was no ticker tape above my cradle, nor did I teeth on the stock pages in the precocious way that Baby Pella copyright supposedly bounced a soccer ball. As far as I know, my father never left the pacing area to check on the price of General Motors, nor did my mother ask about the ATT dividend between contractions. Distrust of stocks was the prevailing American attitude throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s, when the market tripled and then doubled again. This period of my childhood, and not the recent 1980s, was truly the greatest bull market in history, but to hear it from my uncles, you'd have thought it was the craps game behind the pool hall. Never get involved in the market, people warned. It's too risky. You'll lose all your money. I continued to caddy throughout high school and into Boston College, where the Francis Wimmett Caddy Scholarship helped pay the bills. In college, except for the obligatory courses, I avoided science, math, and accounting all the normal preparations for business. I was on the arts side of school, and along with the usual history, psychology, and political science, I also studied metaphysics, epistemology, logic, religion, and the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. Throughout the decade of the 1970s, when Subaru was making its biggest moves, only three or four major analysts kept tabs on it. Dunkin' Donuts was a 25-bagger between 1977 and 1986, yet only two major firms follow it even today. Neither was interested five years ago. Only a few regional brokerages, such as Adams, Harkness, and Hill in Boston, 
got onto this profitable story, but you could have initiated coverage on your own, after you'd eaten the donuts. I am reminded here of the Vonnegut short story in which various highly talented practitioners are deliberately held back, the good dancers wear weights, the good artists have their fingers tied together, etc., so as not to upset the less skillful. When E.F. Hutton talks, everybody is supposed to be listening, but that's just the problem. Everybody ought to be trying to fall asleep. When it comes to predicting the market, the important skill here is not listening, it's snoring. The trick is not to learn to trust your gut feelings, but rather to discipline yourself to ignore them. Stand by your stocks as long as the fundamental story of the company hasn't changed. The people who print prospectuses must have seen Eda they could hardly keep up with all the new shareholders in the mutual funds. The sales force must have seen it as they crisscrossed the country in their Winnebagos and returned with billions in new assets. The maintenance services must have seen the expansion in the offices at Federated, Franklin, Dreyfus, and Fidelity. The companies that sold mutual funds prospered as never before in their history. The mad rush was on. However a stock has come to your attention, whether via the office, the shopping mall, something you ate, something you bought, or something you heard from your broker, your mother-in-law, or even from Ivan Bosky's parole officer, the discovery is not a buy signal. Just because Dunkin' Donuts is always crowded or Reynolds Metals has more aluminum orders than it can handle doesn't mean you ought to own the stock. Not yet. What you've got so far is simply a lead to a story that has to be developed. Developing the story is really not difficult, at most it will take a couple of hours. In the next few chapters I'm going to tell you how I do it, and where you can find the most useful sources of information. The Charman Syndrome is a common affliction, but it's easily cured. All you have to do is put as much effort into picking your stocks as you do into buying your groceries. Even if you already own stocks, it's useful to go through the exercise, because it's possible that some of these stocks will not and cannot live up to your expectations for them. That's because there are different kinds of stocks, and there are limits to how each kind can perform. In developing the story you have to make certain initial distinctions. If you're considering a stock on the strength of some specific product that a company makes, the first thing to find out is, what effect will the success of the product have on the company's bottom line? Back in February of 1988, I recall, investors got very enthused about Redden A, a skin cream made by Johnson & Johnson. Since 1971 this cream had been sold as an acne medicine, but a recent doctor's study suggested it might also fight skin blots and blemishes caused by the sun. The newspapers loved this story, and headline writers called it the anti-aging cream, and the wrinkle fighter. You would have thought that Johnson & Johnson had discovered the fountain of youth. Putting stocks in categories is the first step in developing the story. Now at least you know what kind of story it's supposed to be. The next step is filling in the details that will help you guess how the story is going to turn out. Getting the story on a company is a lot easier if you understand the basic business. That's why I'd rather invest in pantyhose than in communications satellites, or in motel chains than in fiber optics. The simpler it is, the better I like it. When somebody says, any idiot could run this joint, that's a plus as far as I'm concerned because sooner or later any idiot probably is going to be running it. Once in a while a positive story is topped off by an extraordinary kicker, an unexpected valuable card that turns up. In Sai's case it happened when the company struck a very lucrative bargain with another company, American General, that wanted to buy the real estate under one of Sai's Houston locations. In return for the rights to this land, American General, which owned 20% of Sai's stock, gave all their stock back to Sai. Not only did Sai retrieve 20% of its shares at no cost, but it was allowed to continue to operate the funeral home at the old location for two years, until it could open a new home at a different site in Houston. When insiders are buying like crazy, you can be certain that, at a minimum, the company will not go bankrupt in the next six months. When insiders are buying, I'd bet there aren't three companies in history that have gone bankrupt near term. After that interlude at Fidelity, 
I returned to Wharton for my second year of graduate school more skeptical than ever about the value of academic stock market theory. It seemed to me that most of what I learned at Wharton, which was supposed to help you succeed in the investment business, could only help you fail. I studied statistics, advanced calculus, and quantitative analysis. Quantitative analysis taught me that the things I saw happening at Fidelity couldn't really be happening. At 8% interest on $24, note, let's suspend our disbelief and assume they converted the trinkets to cash, compounded over all those years, the Indians would have built up a net worth just short of $30 trillion, while the latest tax records from the borough of Manhattan show the real estate to be worth only $28.1 billion. Give Manhattan the benefit of the doubt, that $28.1 billion is the assessed value, and for all anybody knows it may be worth twice that on the open market. So Manhattan's worth $56.2 billion. Either way, the Indians could be ahead by $29 trillion and change. Bonds have been especially attractive in the last 20 years. Not in the 50 years before that, but definitely in the last 20. Historically, interest rates never strayed far from 4%, but in the last decade we've seen long-term rates rise to 16% then fall to 8%, creating remarkable opportunities. People who bought U.S. Treasury bonds with 20-year maturities in 1980 have seen the face value of their bonds nearly double, and meanwhile they've still been collecting the 16% interest on their original investment. If you were smart enough to have bought 20-year T-bonds then, you've beaten the stock market by a sizable margin, even in this latest bull phase. Moreover, you've done it without having to read a single research report or having to pay a single tribute to a stockbroker. But with the possible exception of the very short-term bonds and bond funds, bonds can be risky, too. Here, rising interest rates will force you to accept one of two unpleasant choices, suffer with the low yield until the bonds mature, or sell the bonds at a substantial discount to face value. If you are truly risk-averse, then the money market fund or the bank is the place for you. Otherwise, there are risks wherever you turn. A lot of people have invested in funds that buy government national mortgage association bonds, Ginny Moss, without realizing how volatile the bond market has become. They are reassured by the ADSA 100% government guaranteed A and they're right, the interest will be paid. But that doesn't protect the value of their shares in the bond fund when interest rates rise and the bond market collapses. Open the business page and look at what happens to such funds on a day that interest rates rise half a percent and you'll see what I mean. These days, bond funds fluctuate just as wildly as stock funds. The same volatility in interest rates that enables clever investors to make big profits from bonds also makes holding bonds more of a gamble. Frankly, there is no way to separate investing from gambling into those neat categories that are meant to reassure us. There's simply no Chinese wall, bundling board, or any other absolute division between safe and rash places to store money. It was in the late 1920s that common stocks finally reached the status of prudent investments, whereas previously they were dismissed as barroom wager saw and this was precisely the moment at which the overvalued market made buying stocks more wager than investment. For two decades after the crash, stocks were regarded as gambling by a majority of the population, and this impression wasn't fully revised until the late 1960s when stocks once again were embraced as investments, but in an overvalued market that made most stocks very risky. Historically, stocks are embraced as investments or dismissed as gambles in routine and circular fashion, and usually at the wrong times. Stocks are most likely to be accepted as prudent at the moment they're not. Because of leverage, if you buy a $100,000 house for 20% down and the value of the house increases by 5% a year, you are making a 25% return on your down payment, and the interest on the loan is tax deductible. Do that well in the stock market and eventually you'd be worth more than Boone Pickens. Do what you want with this, but don't expect me to bet on the cocktail party theory. I don't believe in predicting markets. I believe in buying great companies saw especially companies that are undervalued, and slash or underappreciated. Whether the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 points today, 
you'd be better off having owned Marriott, Merck, and McDonald's than having owned Avon Products, Bethlehem Steel, and Xerox over the last 10 years. You'd also be better off having owned Marriott, Merck, or McDonald's than if you'd put the money into bonds or money market funds over the same period. That's not to say there isn't such a thing as an overvalued market, but there's no point worrying about it. The way you'll know when the market is overvalued is when you can't find a single company that's reasonably priced or that meets your other criteria for investment. The reason Buffett returned his partner's money was that he said he couldn't find any stocks worth owning. He'd looked over hundreds of individual companies and found not one he'd buy on the fundamental merits. You're looking for a situation where the value of the assets per share exceeds the price per share of the stock. In such delightful instances you can truly buy a great deal of something for nothing. I've done it myself numerous times. I always keep some stalwarts in my portfolio because they offer pretty good protection during recessions and hard times. You can see here that during the 1981A82 period, when the country seemed to be falling apart and the stock market fell apart with it, Bristol Myers went sideways, see chart. It didn't do that well in the 1973A74 washout as we've already seen, but nothing escaped that bath, and besides, the stock was grossly overpriced at the time. In general, Bristol Myers and Kellogg, Coca Cola and MMM, Ralston Purina and Procter and Gamble, are good friends in a crisis. You know they won't go bankrupt, and soon enough they will be reassessed and their value will be restored. There's the restructuring to maximize shareholder values kind of turnaround, such as Penn Central. Wall Street seems to favor restructuring these days, and any director or CEO who mentions it is warmly applauded by shareholders. Restructuring is a company's way of ridding itself of certain unprofitable subsidiaries it should never have acquired in the first place. The earlier buying of these ill-fated subsidiaries, also warmly applauded, is called diversification. I call it diversification. Hundreds of thousands of California commuters drive by the Newhall Ranch every day. Insurance appraisers, mortgage bankers, and real estate agents involved in the various Newhall deals certainly knew of the extent of Newhall's holdings and of the general increase in California property values. How many people owned houses in the areas around the Newhall Ranch and saw the great escalation in land values, years ahead of any Wall Street analysts? How many of them considered researching this stock that has been a 20-bagger from the early 70s and a 4-bagger since 1980? If I'd lived in California, I wouldn't have missed it. At least, I hope I wouldn't have. There's no way to overstate the value of exclusive franchises to a company or its shareholders. Inco is the world's great producer of nickel today, and it will be the world's great producer in 50 years. Once I was standing at the edge of the Bingham Pit copper mine in Utah, and looking down into that impressive cavern, it occurred to me that nobody in Japan or Korea can invent a Bingham Pit. I always look for niches. The perfect company would have to have one. Warren Buffett started out by acquiring a textile mill in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which he quickly realized was not a niche business. He did poorly in textiles but went on to make billions for his shareholders by investing in niches. He was one of the first to see the value in newspapers and TV stations that dominated major markets, beginning with the Washington Post. Thinking along the same lines, I bought as much stock as I could in affiliated publications, which owns the local Boston Globe. Since the Globe gets over 90% of the print ad revenues in Boston, how could the Globe lose? Insider selling usually means nothing, and it's silly to react to it. If a stock had gone from $3 to $12 and nine officers were selling, I'd take notice, particularly if they were selling a majority of their shares. But in normal situations insider selling is not an automatic sign of trouble within a company. There are many reasons that officers might sell. They may need the money to pay their children's tuition or to buy a new house or to satisfy a debt. They may have decided to diversify into other stocks. But there's only one reason that insiders buy, they think the stock price is undervalued and will eventually go up. Automatic data processing sounds like the sort of high-tech enterprise I try to avoid, but in reality it's not a computer company. It uses computers to process paychecks, 
and users of technology are the biggest beneficiaries of high-tech. As competition drives down the price of computers, a firm such as Automatic Data can buy the cheaper equipment, so its costs are continually reduced. This only adds to profits. If the stock price drops after the insiders have bought, so that you have a chance to buy it cheaper than they did, so much the better for you. Exxon has been buying in shares because it's cheaper than drilling for oil. It might cost Exxon $6 a barrel to find new oil, but if each of its shares represents $3 a barrel in oil assets, then retiring shares has the same effect as discovering $3 oil on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But for as long as they can keep it up, fast growers are the big winners in the stock market. I look for the ones that have good balance sheets and are making substantial profits. The trick is figuring out when they'll stop growing, and how much to pay for the growth. Whether or not our fortunate investor asked any brokers or other experts for advice I'm not certain, but many would have told him his theory was flawed, and if he knew what was good for him, he'd stick with the blue chips the institutions were buying, or with the hot electronics issues that were popular at the time. Luckily the fireman kept his own counsel. Right there in a freestanding metal rack near the checkout counter was a new display of women's pantyhose, packaged in colorful plastic eggs. The company, Haynes, was test marketing legs at several sites around the country, including suburban Boston. When Haynes interviewed hundreds of women leaving the test supermarkets and asked them if they'd just bought pantyhose, a high percentage answered yes. Yet most of them couldn't recall the name of the brand. Haynes was ecstatic. If a product becomes a bestseller without brand name recognition, imagine how it will sell once the brand is publicized. Consider my friend Harry Houndstooth whose name I've changed to protect the unfortunate. Actually there's a little bit of Houndstooth in all of us. This designated investor, each family seems to have one, has just spent the morning reading the Wall Street Journal, plus a $1.250 a year stock market newsletter to which he subscribes. He's looking for another exciting stock play, something with limited risk but big potential on the upside. In both the journal and his newsletter there's a favorable mention of Winchester Disk Drives, a headstrong little firm with a dandy future. During a lifetime of buying cars or cameras, you develop a sense of what's good and what's bad, what sells and what doesn't. If it's not cars you know something about, you know something about something else, and the most important part is, you know it before Wall Street knows it. Why wait for the Merrill Lynch restaurant expert to recommend Dunkin' Donuts when you've already seen eight new franchises opening up in your area? The Merrill Lynch restaurant analyst isn't going to notice Dunkin' Donuts, for reasons I'll soon explain, until the stock has quintupled from $2 to $10, and you noticed it when the stock was at $2. Does that mean I think you ought to buy shares in every new fast food franchise, every business that has a hot product? or every public company that opens an outlet in the local mall. If it were that simple, I wouldn't have lost money on Bildner's, the yuppie 7-Eleven right across the street from my office. If only I'd stuck to the sandwiches and not to the stock, 50 shares of which would scarcely buy you a tuna on rye. More on this later. In centuries past, people hearing the rooster crow as the sun came up decided that the crowing caused the sunrise. It sounds silly now but every day the experts confuse cause and effect on Wall Street in offering some new explanation for why the market goes up, hemlines are up, a certain conference wins the Super Bowl, the Japanese are unhappy, a trend line has been broken, Republicans will win the election, stocks are oversold, etc. When I hear theories like these, I always remember the rooster. During my senior year at Boston College I applied for a summer job at Fidelity, at the suggestion of Mr. Sullivan, the presidential the hapless golfer, great guy and good tipper for whom I'd caddied. Fidelity was the New York Yacht Club, the Augusta National, the Carnegie Hall, and the Kentucky Derby. It was the Clooney of investment houses, and like that great medieval abbey to which monks were flattered to be called, what devotee of balance sheets didn't dream of working here? There were 100 applications for three summer positions. Ned Johnson's Fidelity trend and Gary Tsai's Fidelity Capital outperformed the competition by a big margin and were the envy of the industry over the period from 1958 to 1965. 
With these sorts of people training and supporting me, I felt as if I understood what Isaac Newton was talking about when he said, if I have seen further it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. I was thrilled to be hired at Fidelity, and also to be installed in Gary Tsai's old office, after Tsai had departed for the Manhattan Fund in New York. Of course the Dow Jones Industrials, at 925 when I reported for work the first week of May, 1966, had fallen below 800 by the time I headed off to graduate school in September, just as the Lynch Law would have predicted. Summer interns such as me, with no experience in corporate finance or accounting, were put to work researching companies and writing reports, the same as the regular analysts. The whole intimidating business was suddenly demystified. Even liberal arts majors could analyze a stock. I was assigned to the paper and publishing industry and set out across the country to visit companies such as Sorg Paper and International Textbook. Since the airlines were on strike, I traveled by bus. By the end of the summer the company I knew most about was Greyhound. It also was obvious that Wharton professors who believed in quantum analysis and random walk weren't doing nearly as well as my new colleagues at Fidelity, so between theory and practice, I cast my lot with the practitioners. It's very hard to support the popular academic theory that the market is irrational when you know somebody who just made a 20-fold profit in Kentucky Fried Chicken, and furthermore, who explained in advance why the stock was going to rise. My distrust of theorizers and prognosticators continues to the present day. After finishing that second year at Warden, I reported to the Army to serve my two-year hitch required under the ROTC program. From 1967 to 1969, I was a lieutenant in the artillery, sent first to Texas and later to Korea a comforting assignment considering the alternative. Lieutenants in the artillery mostly wound up in Vietnam. The only drawback to Korea was that it was far away from the stock exchange, and as far as I knew, there was no stock market in Seoul. By this time I was suffering from Wall Street withdrawal. The main sugar people had gone around to all the main potato farmers to convince them to grow sugar beets in the off-season. This was going to be extremely profitable for main sugar, not to mention for the main farmers. By planting the sugar beets of the perfect companion crop to potato Esau farmers could make extra money and revitalize the soil at the same time. Moreover, main sugar was footing the bill for planting the beets. All the farmers had to do was haul the grown-up beets to the huge new refinery that main sugar had just built. You have to understand the minds of the people in our business. We all read the same newspapers and magazines and listen to the same economists. We're a very homogeneous lot, quite frankly. There aren't many among us who walked in off the beach. If there are any high school dropouts running an equity mutual fund, I'd be surprised. I doubt there are any ex-surfers or former truck drivers, either. The first institution which bought shares in the limited was T. Rowe Price New Horizons Fund, and that was in the summer of 1975. By then there were 100 limited stores open for business across the country. Thousands of observant shoppers could have initiated their own coverage during this period. Still, by 1979, only two institutions owned limited stock, accounting for 0.6% of the outstanding shares. Employees and executives in the company were heavy owners saw usually a good sign, as we'll discuss later. I'm also reminded of the little slips of paper that say inspected by four that are stuck inside the pockets of new shirts. The inspected by four method is how stocks are selected from the lists. The would-be decision makers hardly know what they are approving. They don't travel around visiting companies or researching new products, they just take what they're given and pass it along. I think of this every time I buy shirts. Then Flint moves along to Seven Oaks International which happens to be one of my all-time favorite picks. Ever wonder what happens to all those discount coupons off 15 cents off Heinz ketchup, 25 cents off Windex, etc. A after you clip them from the newspapers and then turn them in at your supermarket checkout counter? Your supermarket wraps them up and sends them off to the Seven Oaks plant in Mexico, where piles of coupons are collated, processed, and cleared for payment, much as a check is cleared through the Federal Reserve Banks. Seven Oaks makes a lot of money doing this boring job, 
and the shareholders are well rewarded. It's exactly the kind of obscure, boring, and highly profitable company with an inscrutable name that I like to own. Before too many of my colleagues cry foul, let me once again praise the notable exceptions. The portfolio departments of many regional banks outside of New York City have done an outstanding job picking stocks for an extended period of time. Many corporations, especially the medium-sized ones, have distinguished themselves in managing their pension money. A nationwide review would certainly turn up dozens of outstanding stock pickers who work for insurance funds, pension funds, and trust accounts. Most important, you can find terrific opportunities in the neighborhood or at the workplace, months, or even years before the news has reached the analysts and the fund managers they advise. Then from the 1916 list we see Baldwin Locomotive, gone by 1924. The 1925 list includes such household names as Paramount Famous Lasky and Remington Typewriter. In 1927, Remington Typewriter disappears and United Drug takes its place. In 1928, when the Dow Jones was expanded from 20 to 30 companies, the new arrivals included Nash Motors, Postum, Wright Aeronautical, and Victor Talking Machine. The latter two companies were removed by 1929A Victor Talking Machine because it had merged into RCA. You've seen the results of sticking with that one. In 1950, we find corn products refining on the list, but by 1959 it, too, is taken off and replaced by Swift and CO. The greatest advantage to investing in stocks, to one who accepts the uncertainties, is the extraordinary reward for being right. This is borne out in the mutual fund returns calculated by the Johnson Chart Service of Buffalo, New York. There's a very interesting correlation here, the riskier the fund, the better the payoff. If you'd put $10,000 into the average bond fund in 1963, 15 years later you'd come out with $31,338. The same $10,000 in a balanced fund, stocks and bonds, would have produced $44,343, in a growth and income fund, all stocks, $53,157, and in an aggressive growth fund, also all stocks, $76,556. Clearly the stock market has been a gamble worth taking ga as long as you know how to play the game. And as long as you own stocks, new cards keep turning up. Now that I think of it, Investing in stocks isn't really like playing a 7-card stud poker hand. It's more like playing a 70-card stud poker hand, or if you own 10 stocks, it's like playing 10 70-card hands at once. There are important secondary reasons you'll do better in houses than in stocks. It's not likely you'll get scared out of your house by reading a headline in the Sunday real estate section, Home Prices Take Dive. They don't publish the Friday afternoon closing market price of your home address in the classifieds, nor do they run it across the ticker tape at the bottom of your TV, and newscasters do not come on with lists of the 10 most active house so 100 Orchard Lane is down 10% today. Neighbors saw nothing unusual to account for this unexpected decline. Houses, like stocks, are most likely to be profitable when they're held for a long period of time. Unlike stocks, Houses are likely to be owned by the same person for a number of years a seven, I think, is the average. Compare this to the 87% of all the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that change hands every year. People get much more comfortable in their houses than they do in their stocks. It takes a moving van to get out of a house, and only a phone call to get out of a stock. And finally, it's crucial to be able to resist your human nature and your gut feelings. It's the rare investor who doesn't secretly harbor the conviction that he or she has a knack for divining stock prices or gold prices or interest rates, in spite of the fact that most of us have been proven wrong again and again. It's uncanny how often people feel most strongly that stocks are going to go up or the economy is going to improve just when the opposite occurs. This is borne out by the popular investment advisory newsletter services, which themselves tend to turn bullish and bearish at inopportune moments. According to information published by Investors Intelligence, which tracks investor sentiment via the newsletters, at the end of 1972, when stocks were about to tumble, optimism was at an all-time high, 
with only 15% of the advisors bearish. At the beginning of the stock market rebound in 1974, investor sentiment was at an all-time low, with 65% of the advisors fearing the worst was yet to come. Before the market turned downward in 1977, once again the newsletter writers were optimistic, with only 10% bears. At the start of the 1982 send-off into a great bull market, 55% of the advisors were bears, and just prior to the big gulp of October 19, 1987, 80% of the advisors were bulls again. The problem isn't that investors and their advisors are chronically stupid or unperceptive. It's that by the time the signal is received, the message may already have changed. When enough positive general financial news filters down so that the majority of investors feel truly confident in the short-term prospects, the economy is soon to get hammered. It's amazing how quickly investor sentiment can be reversed, even when reality hasn't changed. A week or two before the big burp of October, business travelers were driving through Atlanta, Orlando, or Chicago, admiring the new construction and remarking to each other, Wow! What a glorious boom! A few days later, I'm sure those same travelers were looking at those same buildings and saying, Boy, this place has problems. How are they ever going to sell all those condos and rent all that office space? Every year I talk to the executives of a thousand companies, and I can't avoid hearing from the various gold bugs, interest rate disciples, Federal Reserve watchers, and fiscal mystics quoted in the newspapers. Thousands of experts study overbought indicators, oversold indicators, head and shoulder patterns, put call ratios, the Fed's policy on money supply, foreign investment, the movement of the constellations through the heavens, and the moss on oak trees, and they can't predict markets with any useful consistency, any more than the gizzard squeezers could tell the Roman emperors when the Huns would attack. There's another theory that we have recessions every five years, but it hasn't happened that way so far. I've looked in the Constitution, and nowhere is it written that every fifth year we have to have one. Of course, I'd love to be warned before we do go into a recession, so I could adjust my portfolio. But the odds of my figuring it out are nil. Some people wait for these bells to go off, to signal the end of a recession or the beginning of an exciting new bull market. The trouble is the bells never go off. Remember, things are never clear until it's too late. After that, the survivors of the fire came down out of the trees and ran as far away from woods as possible. They built new houses out of stone, particularly along a craggy fissure. Soon enough, the world was destroyed by an earthquake. I don't remember the fourth bad thing that happened at a maybe a recession ah but whatever it was, the Mayans were going to miss it. They were too busy building shelters for the next earthquake. In stage two, after I've confessed what I do for a living, the new acquaintances linger a bit longer of perhaps long enough to tell me how risky the stock market ISA before they move over to talk to the dentist. The cocktail party talk is still more about plaque than about stocks. The market's up 15% from stage one, but few are paying attention. If you knew there was going to be a Florida real estate boom and you picked Radis out of a hat, you would have lost 95% of your investment. If you knew there was a computer boom and you picked Fortune Systems without doing any homework, you'd have seen it fall from $22 in 1983 to $17 slash 8 in 1984. If you knew the early 1980s was bullish for airlines, what good would it have done if you'd invested in People Express, which promptly bought the farm, or Pan Am, which declined from $9 in 1983 to $4 in 1984 thanks to inept management. Let's say you knew that steel was making a comeback, and so you took a list of steel stocks, taped it to a dartboard, and threw a dart at LTV. LTV declined from $261-2 to $11-8 between 1981 and 1986, roughly the period in which Nucor, a company in the same industry, rose from $10 to $50. I owned both, so why did I sell my Nucor and hold on to my LTV? I might as well have thrown darts, too. If you want to worry about something, worry about whether the sheet business is getting better at West Point Pepperell, or whether Taco Bell is doing well with its new Burrito Supreme.
Pick the right stocks and the market will take care of itself. The best place to begin looking for the ten bagger is close to Homia if not in the backyard then down at the shopping mall, and especially wherever you happen to work. With most of the ten baggers already mentioned Dunkin' Donuts, The Limited, Subaru, Dreyfus, McDonald's, Tambrans, and Pep Boys of the first sips of success were apparent at hundreds of locations across the country. The firemen in New England, the customers in central Ohio where Kentucky Fried Chicken first opened up, the mob down at Pick and Save, all had a chance to say, this is great, I wonder about the stock, long before Wall Street got its original clue. The average person comes across a likely prospect two or three times a year as sometimes more. Executives at Pep Boys, clerks at Pep Boys, lawyers and accountants, suppliers of Pep Boys, the firm that did the advertising, sign painters, building contractors for the new stores, and even the people who washed the floors all must have observed Pep Boys' success. Thousands of potential investors got this tip, and that doesn't even count the hundreds of thousands of customers. At the same time, the Pep Boys employee who buys insurance for the company could have noticed that insurance prices were going UPA which is a good sign that the insurance industry is about to turn around it and so maybe he'd consider investing in the insurance suppliers. Or maybe the Pep Boys building contractors noticed that cement prices had firmed, which is good news for the companies that supply cement. You don't have to work in Kodak's main office to learn that the new generation of inexpensive, easy to use. High-quality 35mm cameras from Japan is reviving the photo industry, and that film sales are up. You could be a film salesman, the owner of a camera store, or a clerk in a camera store. You could also be the local wedding photographer who notices that five or six relatives are taking unofficial pictures at weddings and making it harder for you to get good shots. Maybe you're a teacher and the school board chooses your school to test a new gizmo that takes attendance saving the teachers thousands of wasted hours counting heads. Who makes this gizmo, is the first question I'd ask. What most people get out of family photo albums, I get out of these wonderful publications. If my life were to flash before my eyes, I bet I'd see the chart of Flying Tiger, my first ten beggar, of Apple Computer, a stock I rediscovered thanks in part to my family, and Polaroid which makes me remember the new camera that my wife and I took on our honeymoon. That was back in a more primitive era, when we had to let the film develop for 60 seconds before we could see the picture. Since neither of us had a watch, Carolyn used her physiology training and counted out the seconds with her pulse. The oil man who invests in Smith Klein because his broker suggests it won't realize that patients have abandoned Tagamet and switched to a rival ulcer drug until the stock is down 40% and the bad news has been fully discounted in the price. Discounting is a Wall Street euphemism for pretending to have anticipated surprising developments. The professional's edge is especially helpful in knowing when and when not to buy shares in companies that have been around a while, especially those in the so-called cyclical industries. If you work in the chemical industry, then you'll be among the first to realize that demand for polyvinyl chloride is going up, prices are going up, and excess inventories are going down. You'll be in a position to know that no new competitors have entered the market and no new plants are under construction, and that it takes two to three years to build one. All this means higher profits for existing companies that make the product. Or if you own a Goodyear tire store and suddenly after three years of sluggish sales you notice that you can't keep up with new orders, you've just received a strong signal that Goodyear may be on the rise. You already know that Goodyear's new high-performance tire is the best. You call up your broker and ask for the latest background information on the tire company, instead of waiting for the broker to call to tell you about Wong Laboratories. I could go on for the rest of the book about the edge that being in a business gives the average stock picker. On top of that, there's the consumer's edge that's helpful in picking out the winners from the newer and smaller fast-growing companies, especially in the retail trades. Whichever edge applies, the exciting part is that you can develop your own stock detection system outside the normal channels of Wall Street, where you'll always get the news late. Procter & Gamble is a good illustration of what I'm talking about. Remember I mentioned that Legs was one of the two most profitable new products of the 1970s. The other was Pampers. 
Any friend or relative of a baby could have realized how popular Pampers were, and right on the box it says that Pampers are made by Procter & Gamble. Everything else being equal, you'll do better with the smaller companies. In the last decade you'd have made more money on Pick & Save than on Sears, although both are retail chains. Now that waste management is a multi-billion dollar conglomerate, it will probably lag behind the speedy new entries in the waste removal field. In the recent comeback of the steel industry, shareholders in the smaller new core have fared better than shareholders in U.S. Steel, now USX. In the earlier comeback of the drug industry, the smaller Smith Klein Beckman outperformed the larger American home products. Another sure sign of a slow grower is that it pays a generous and regular dividend. As I'll discuss more fully in Chapter 13, Companies pay generous dividends when they can't dream up new ways to use the money to expand the business. Corporate managers would much prefer to expand the business, an effort that always enhances their prestige, than to pay a dividend, an effort that is mechanical and requires no imagination. Bristol Myers has had only one down quarter in 20 years, and Kellogg hasn't had a down quarter for 30. It's no accident that Kellogg can survive recessions. No matter how bad things get, people still eat cornflakes. They may take fewer trips, postpone the purchase of new cars, buy fewer clothes and expensive knickknacks, and order fewer lobster dinners at restaurants, but they eat just as many cornflakes as ever. Maybe they eat more cornflakes, to make up for the lack of lobsters. These are among my favorite investments, small aggressive new enterprises that grow at 20 to 25 percent a year. If you choose wisely, this is the land of the 10 to 40 baggers, and even the 200 baggers. With a small portfolio, one or two of these can make a career. Coming out of a recession and into a vigorous economy, the cyclicals flourish, and their stock prices tend to rise much faster than the prices of the stalwarts. This is understandable since people buy new cars and take more airplane trips in a vigorous economy, and there's greater demand for steel, chemicals, etc. But going the other direction, the cyclicals suffer, and so do the pocketbooks of the shareholders. You can lose more than 50% of your investment very quickly if you buy cyclicals in the wrong part of the cycle, and it may be years before you'll see another upswing. There's the little problem we didn't anticipate kind of turnaround such as Three Mile Island. This was a minor tragedy perceived to be worse than it was, and in minor tragedy there's major opportunity. I made a lot of money in general public utilities, the owner of Three Mile Island. Anybody could have. You just had to be patient, keep up with the news, and read it with dispassion. After the original meltdown of the nuclear unit in 1979 the situation eventually stabilized. In 1985 GPU announced it was going to start up the sister reactor that had been turned off for years after the crisis but was unaffected by it. It was a good sign for the stock that they got that sister plant back online, and an even better sign when other utilities agreed to share in the costs of the Three Mile Island cleanup. You had almost seven years to buy the stock after the place calmed down and all this good news had come out. The low of 33 eighths was reached in 1980 but you could still have gotten in for $15 a share in late 1985 and watched the stock hit $38 in October, 1988. There are asset plays in metals and in oil, in newspapers and in TV stations, in patented drugs and even sometimes in a company's losses. That's what happened with Penn Central. After it came out of bankruptcy, Penn Central had a huge tax loss carry forward, which meant that when it started making money again, it wouldn't have to pay taxes. In those years the corporate tax rate was 50%, so Penn Central was reborn with a 50% advantage up front. The literature sent to shareholders explaining the spin-off is usually hastily prepared, blase copyright, and understated, which makes it even better than the regular annual reports. Spin-off companies are often misunderstood and get little attention from Wall Street. Investors often are sent shares in the newly created company as a bonus or a dividend for owning the parent company, and institutions, especially, tend to dismiss these shares as pocket change or found money. These are favorable omens for the spin-off stocks. This is a fertile area for the amateur shareholder, 
especially in the recent frenzy of mergers and acquisitions. Companies that are targets of hostile takeovers frequently fight off raiders by selling or spinning off divisions that then become publicly traded issues on their own. When a company is taken over, the parts are often sold off for cash, and they, too, become separate entities in which to invest. If you hear about a spin-off, or if you're sent a few fractions of shares in some newly created company, begin an immediate investigation into buying more. A month or two after the spin-off is completed, you can check to see if there is heavy insider buying among the new officers and directors. This will confirm that they, too, believe in the company's prospects. Investors who owned the old ATT stock had 18 months to decide what to do. They could sell ATT and be done with the whole complicated mess, they could keep ATT plus the shares and fractions of shares in the new baby bells that they received or they could sell the parent and keep the baby bells. If they did their homework, they sold ATT, kept the baby bells, and added to their position with as many more shares as they could afford. Waste management is a better prospect even than safety clean because it has two unthinkables going for it, toxic waste itself, and also the mafia. Everyone who fantasizes that the mafia runs all the Italian restaurants, the newsstands, the dry cleaners, the construction sites, and the olive presses also probably thinks that the mafia controls the garbage business. This fantastic assertion was a great advantage to the earliest buyers of shares in waste management, which as usual were underpriced relative to the actual opportunity. I'd rather invest in a company that makes drugs, soft drinks, razor blades, or cigarettes than in a company that makes toys. In the toy industry somebody can make a wonderful doll that every child has to have but every child gets only one each. Eight months later that product is taken off the shelves to make room for the newest doll the children have to have via manufactured by somebody else. The common alternatives to buying back shares are, 1, raising the dividend, 2, developing new products, 3, starting new operations, and, 4, making acquisitions. Gillette tried to do all four, with emphasis on the final three. Gillette has a spectacularly profitable razor business, which it gradually reduced in relative size as it acquired less profitable operations. If the company had regularly bought back its shares and raised its dividend instead of diverting its capital to cosmetics, toiletries, ballpoint pens, cigarette lighters, curlers, blenders, office products, toothbrushes, hair care, digital watches, and lots of other diversions, the stock might well be worth over $100 instead of the current $35. In the last five years, Gillette has gotten back on track by eliminating losing operations and emphasizing its core shaving business, where it dominates the market. Its headquarters are located in the bayous of Louisiana, and to get there you have to change planes twice, then hire a pickup truck to take you from the airport. Not one analyst from New York or Boston ever visited Cajun cleansers, nor has any institution bought a solitary share. While expanding quickly through the bayous and the Ozarks, Cajun Cleansers has had incredible sales. These sales will soon accelerate because the company just received a patent on a new gel that removes all sorts of stains from clothes, furniture, carpets, bathroom tiles, and even aluminum siding. The patent gives Cajun the niche it's been looking for. No popular magazines except the ones that think Elvis is alive have mentioned Cajun and its new patent. The stock opened at $8 in a public offering seven years ago and soon rose to $10. At that price the important corporate directors bought as many shares as they could afford. In the case of Subaru the stock never actually sold for $312. There had been an 8 for 1 split just before the high, so the stock was actually at $39 at the time. To conform with this price, all pre-split levels must be divided by 8. In particular, the $2 low in 1977 is now a split adjusted 25 cents per share, although the stock never actually sold for 25 cents. Whenever fund managers do decide to buy something exciting, against all the social and political obstacles, they may be held back by various written rules and regulations. Some bank trust departments simply won't allow the buying of stocks in any companies with unions. Others won't invest in non-growth industries or in specific industry groups, 
such as electric utilities or oil or steel. Sometimes it gets to the point that the fund manager can't buy shares in any company whose name begins with R, or perhaps the shares must be acquired only in months that have an R in their name, a rule that's been borrowed from the eating of oysters. Equity mutual funds such as mine are less restricted. I don't have to buy stocks from a fixed menu, and there's no Mr. Flint hovering over my shoulder. That's not to say that my bosses and overseers at Fidelity don't monitor my progress, ask me challenging questions, and periodically review my results. It's just that nobody tells me I must own Xerox, or that I can't own Seven Oaks. Glance at a list of the original Dow Jones Industrials from 1896. Who's ever heard of American cotton oil, distilling and cattle feeding, Lockleed gas, U.S. leather preferred? These once famous stocks must have vanished long ago. I wasn't the only one who failed to issue a warning. In fact, if ignorance loves company, then I was very comfortably surrounded by a large and impressive mob of famous seers, prognosticators, and other experts who failed to see it, too. If you must forecast, an intelligent forecaster once said, forecast often. These users and prescribers had a big lead on the Wall Street talent. No doubt some of the oxymorons suffered from ulcers themselves so this is an anxious business ah but Smith Klein must not have been included on their buy lists, because it was a year before the stock began its ascent. During the testing period for the drug, 1974A76, the price climbed from around $4 to $7, and when the government approved Tagamet in 1977, the stock sold for $11. From there it shot up to $72 see chart, dot asterisk. The list below is only a partial record of the many ten baggers I've either neglected to buy or sold too soon during the period I've managed Magellan. With a few of them I got a small part of the gain, and with others I managed to lose money through bad timing and fuzzy thinking. You'll notice the list goes only up to M, but that's only because I got tired of writing them down. This being an incomplete account, you can imagine how many opportunities must be out there. In fact, you ought to treat the initial information, whatever brought this company to your attention, as if it were an anonymous and intriguing tip, mysteriously shoved into your mailbox. This will keep you from buying a stock just because you've seen something you like, or worse, because of the reputation of the tipper, as in, Uncle Harry's buying it, and he's rich, so he must know what he's talking about. Or, Uncle Harry's buying it, and so am I because his last stock tip doubled. Things inside humans make them terrible stock market timers. The unwary investor continually passes in and out of three emotional states, concern, complacency, and capitulation. He's concerned after the market has dropped or the economy has seemed to falter, which keeps him from buying good companies at bargain prices. Then after he buys at higher prices, he gets complacent because his stocks are going up. This is precisely the time he ought to be concerned enough to check the fundamentals, but he isn't. Then finally, when his stocks fall on hard times and the prices fall to below what he paid, he capitulates and sells in a snit. Companies don't stay in the same category forever. Over my years of watching stocks I've seen hundreds of them start out fitting one description and end up fitting another. Fast growers can lead exciting lives, and then they burn out just as humans can. They can't maintain double-digit growth forever and sooner or later they exhaust themselves and settle down into the comfortable single digits of sluggards and stalwarts. I've already seen it happen in the carpet business and in plastics, calculators and disk drives, health maintenance and computers. From Dow Chemical to Tampa Electric, the high flyers of one decade become the groundhogs of the next. Stop and shop went from being a slow grower to a fast grower, an unusual reversal. At Teledyne, Chairman Henry E. Singleton periodically offers to buy in the stock at a much higher price than is bid on the stock exchange. When Teledyne was selling for $5, he might have paid $7, and when the stock was at $10, then he was paying $14, and so on. All along he's given shareholders a chance to get out at a fancy premium. This practical demonstration of Teledyne's belief in itself is more convincing than the adjectives in the annual report. 
it's one thing to prefer stocks to a stodgy savings account that yields 5% forever, and quite another to prefer them to a money market that offers the best short-term rates, and where the yields rise right away if the prevailing interest rates go higher. If your money has stayed in a money market fund since 1978, you certainly have no reason to feel embarrassed about it. You've missed a couple of major stock market declines. The worst you've ever collected is 6% interest, and you've never lost a penny of your principal. The year that short-term interest rates rose to 17%, 1981, and the stock market dropped 5%, you made a 22% relative gain by staying in cash. Some have fancied themselves long-term investors, but only until the next big drop, or tiny gain, at which point they quickly become short-term investors and sell out for huge losses or the occasional minuscule profit. It's easy to panic in this volatile business. Since I've run Magellan, the fund has declined from 10 to 35% during eight bearish episodes, and in 1987 alone the fund was up 40% in August, down 11% by December. We finished the year with a 1% gain, thus barely preserving my record of never having had a down year in knock on wood. Recently I read that the price of an average stock fluctuates 50% in an average year. If that's true, and apparently it's been true throughout this century, then any share currently selling for $50 is likely to hit $60 and slash or fall to $40 sometime in the next 12 months. In other words, the high for the year, $60, is 50% higher than the low, $40. If you're the kind of buyer who can't resist getting in at $50, buying more at $60, see, I was right, that sucker is going up, and then selling out in despair at $40, I guess I was wrong. That sucker's going down, then no shelf of how-to books is going to help you. Some have fancied themselves contrarians, believing that they can profit by zigging when the rest of the world is zagging but it didn't occur to them to become contrarian until that idea had already gotten so popular that contrarianism became the accepted view. The true contrarian is not the investor who takes the opposite side of a popular hot issue, i.e., shorting a stock that everyone else is buying. The true contrarian waits for things to cool down and buys stocks that nobody cares about, and especially those that make Wall Street yawn. A cent ignore short-term fluctuations. A cent predicting the short-term direction of the stock market is futile. It seems to me that this homework phase is just as important to your success in stocks as your previous vow to ignore the short-term gyrations of the market. Perhaps some people make money in stocks without doing any of the research I'll describe, but why take unnecessary chances? Investing without research is like playing stud poker and never looking at the cards. I'd love to be able to predict markets and anticipate recessions, but since that's impossible, I'm as satisfied to search out profitable companies as Buffett is. I've made money even in lousy markets, and vice versa. Several of my favorite ten baggers made their biggest moves during bad markets. Taco Bell soared through the last two recessions. The only down year in the stock market in the 80s was 1981, and yet it was the perfect time to buy Dreyfus, which began its fantastic march from $2 to $40 the 20 bagger that yours truly managed to miss. The size of a company has a great deal to do with what you can expect to get out of the stock. How big is this company in which you've taken an interest? Specific products aside, big companies don't have big stock moves. In certain markets they perform well, but you'll get your biggest moves in smaller companies. You don't buy stock in a giant such as Coca-Cola expecting to quadruple your money in two years. If you buy Coca-Cola at the right price, you might triple your money in six years, but you're not going to hit the jackpot in two. Is General Electric a good investment, isn't the first thing I'd inquire about a stock. Even if General Electric is a good investment, it still doesn't mean you ought to own it. There's no point in studying the financial section until you've looked into the nearest mirror. Before you buy a share of anything, there are three personal issues that ought to be addressed. 1. Do I own a house? 2. Do I need the money? And, 3. Do I have the personal qualities that will bring me success in stocks?
Whether stocks make good or bad investments depends more on your responses to these three questions than on anything you'll read in the Wall Street Journal. Probably I could go on for several chapters with further highlights, but I'd rather not waste your time. I prefer to write about something you might find more valuable, how to identify the superior companies. Whether it's a 508-point day or a 108-point day, in the end, superior companies will succeed and mediocre companies will fail, and investors in each will be rewarded accordingly. Carolyn didn't need to be a textile analyst to realize that Legs was a superior product. All she had to do was buy a pair and try them on. These stockings had what they call a heavier denier, which made them less likely to develop a run than the normal stockings. They also fit very well, but the main attraction was convenience. You could pick up legs right next to the bubble gum and the razor blades, and without having to make a special trip to the department store. Consistent winners also resign themselves to the fact that they'll occasionally be dealt three aces and bet the limit, only to lose to a hidden royal flush. They accept their fate and go on to the next hand, confident that their basic method will reward them over time. People who succeed in the stock market also accept periodic losses, setbacks, and unexpected occurrences. Calamitous drops do not scare them out of the game. If they've done the proper homework on H&R Block and bought the stock, and suddenly the government simplifies the tax code, an unlikely prospect, granted, and Block's business deteriorates, they accept the bad break and start looking for the next stock. They realize the stock market is not pure science, and not like chess, where the superior position always wins. If 7 out of 10 of my stocks perform as expected, then I'm delighted. If 6 out of 10 of my stocks perform as expected, then I'm thankful. 6 out of 10 is all it takes to produce an enviable record on Wall Street. A cent the long-term returns from stocks are both relatively predictable and also far superior to the long-term returns from bonds. In high school I began to understand the subtler and more important advantages of caddying, especially at an exclusive club such as Bray Burn, outside of Boston. My clients were the presidents and CEOs of major corporations, Gillette, Polaroid, and more to the point, Fidelity. In helping D. George Sullivan find his ball, I was helping myself find a career. I'm not the only caddy who learned that the quickest route to the boardroom was through the locker room of a club like Bray Burn. If your first stock is as important to your future in finance as your first love is to your future in romance, then the Flying Tiger pick was a very lucky thing. It proved to me that the big baggers existed, and I was sure there were more of them from where this one had come. To the list of famous oxymoron saw military intelligence, learned professor, deafening silence, and jumbo shrimpa I'd add professional investing. It's important for amateurs to view the profession with a properly skeptical eye. At least you'll realize whom you're up against. Since 70% of the shares in major companies are controlled by institutions, it's increasingly likely that you're competing against oxymorons whenever you buy or sell shares. This is a lucky break for you. Given the numerous cultural, legal, and social barriers that restrain professional investors, many of which we've nailed up ourselves, it's amazing that we've done as well as we have, as a group. Two company presidents, Smith and Jones, both of whom have pension accounts managed by the National Bank of River City, are playing golf together, as they always do. While waiting to tee off, they chat about important things such as pension accounts, and soon they discover that while Smith's account is up 40% for the year, Jones's account is up 28%. Both men ought to be satisfied, but Jones is livid. Early Monday morning he's on the phone with an officer of the bank, demanding to know why his money has underperformed Smith's money, when, after all, both accounts are handled by the same pension department. If it happens again, Jones blusters, we're pulling our money out. This is the most important question of all. It seems to me the list of qualities ought to include patience, self-reliance, common sense, a tolerance for pain, open-mindedness, detachment, persistence, humility, flexibility, a willingness to do independent research, an equal willingness to admit to mistakes, and the ability to ignore general panic. In terms of IQ, 
probably the best investors fall somewhere above the bottom 10% but also below the top 3%. The true geniuses, it seems to me, get too enamored of theoretical cogitations and are forever betrayed by the actual behavior of stocks, which is more simple-minded than they can imagine. It's also important to be able to make decisions without complete or perfect information. Things are almost never clear on Wall Street, or when they are, then it's too late to profit from them. The scientific mind that needs to know all the data will be thwarted here. I'd been coming to work here for nearly two decades. I know half the officers in the major financial service companies, I follow the daily ups and downs, and I could notice important trends months before the analysts on Wall Street. You couldn't have been more strategically placed to cash in on the bonanza of the early 1980s. Timing is everything in cyclicals, and you have to be able to detect the early signs that business is falling off or picking up. If you work in some profession that's connected to steel, aluminum, airlines, automobiles, etc., then you've got your edge and nowhere is it more important than in this kind of investment. Any idiot can run this business is one characteristic of the perfect company, the kind of stock I dream about. You never find the perfect company, but if you can imagine it, then you'll know how to recognize favorable attributes, the most important 13 of which are as follows. Long term, there's another important benefit. When management owns stock, then rewarding the shareholders becomes a first priority, whereas when management simply collects a paycheck, then increasing salaries becomes a first priority. Since bigger companies tend to pay bigger salaries to executives, there's a natural tendency for corporate wage earners to expand the business at any cost, often to the detriment of shareholders. This happens less often when management is heavily invested in shares. As a bonus you get a federal tax deduction on the local real estate tax on the house, plus the house is a perfect hedge against inflation and a great place to hide out during a recession, not to mention the roof over your head. Then at the end, if you decide to cash in your house, you can roll the proceeds into a fancier house to avoid paying taxes on your profit. There was a 16-month recession between July, 1981, and November, 1982. Actually this was the scariest time in my memory. Sensible professionals wondered if they should take up hunting and fishing, because soon we'd all be living in the woods, gathering acorns. This was a period when we had 14% unemployment, 15% inflation and a 20% prime rate, but I never got a phone call saying any of that was going to happen, either. After the fact a lot of people stood up to announce they'd been expecting it but nobody mentioned it to me before the fact. Two thousand years later we're still looking backward for signs of the upcoming menace, but that's only if we can decide what the upcoming menace is. Not long ago, people were worried that oil prices would drop to $5 a barrel and we'd have a depression. Two years before that, those same people were worried that oil prices would rise to $100 a barrel and we'd have a depression. Once they were scared that the money supply was growing too fast. Now they're scared that it's growing too slow. The last time we prepared for inflation we got a recession, and then at the end of the recession we prepared for more recession and we got inflation. Someday there will be another recession, which will be very bad for the stock market, as opposed to the inflation that is also very bad for the stock market. Maybe there will already have been a recession between now and the time this is published. Maybe we won't get one until 1990, or 1994. You're asking me? This is where the author, a professional investor, promises the reader that for the next 300 pages he'll share the secrets of his success. But rule number one, in my book, is, stop listening to professionals. Twenty years in this business convinces me that any normal person using the customary 3% of the brain can pick stocks just as well if not better, than the average Wall Street expert. These notable exceptions are entirely outnumbered by the run-of-the-mill fund managers, dull fund managers, comatose fund managers, sycophantic fund managers, timid fund managers, plus other assorted camp followers, fuddy-duddies, and copycats hemmed in by the rules. Fund managers in general spend a quarter of their working hours explaining what they just died a first to their immediate bosses in their own trust department and then to their ultimate bosses, 
the clients like flint at white bread. There's an unwritten rule that the bigger the client, the more talking the portfolio manager has to do to please him. There are notable exceptions saw Ford Motor, Eastman Kodak, and Eaton to name a few but in general, it's true. If it's not the bank or the mutual fund making up rules, then it's the SEC. For instance, the SEC says a mutual fund such as mine cannot own more than 10% of the shares in any given company, nor can we invest more than 5% of the fund's assets in any given stock. You don't have to spend a quarter of your waking hours explaining to a colleague why you are buying what you are buying. There's no rule prohibiting you from buying a stock that begins with R, a stock that costs less than $6, or a stock in a company that's connected to the Teamsters. There's nobody to gripe. I never heard of Walmart or Dunkin' Donuts sounds silly ah John D. Rockefeller wouldn't have invested in donuts. There's nobody to chide you for buying back a stock at $19 that you earlier sold at $11a which may be a perfectly sensible move. Professionals could never buy back a stock at $19 that they sold at $11. They'd have their quatrains confiscated for doing that. Finally. You're a good investor in houses because you know how to poke around from the attic to the basement and ask the right questions. The skill of poking around houses is handed down. You grow up watching how your parents checked into the public services, the schools, the drainage, the septic perp test, and the taxes. You remember rules such as don't buy the highest priced property on the block. You can spot neighborhoods on the way up and neighborhoods on the way down. You can drive through an area and see what's being fixed up, what's run down, how many houses are left to renovate. Then, before you make an offer on a house, you hire experts to search for termites, roof leaks, dry rot, rusty pipes, faulty wiring, and cracks in the foundation. The effect is most striking in weak stock markets ah yes, there are 10 beggars in weak markets. Let's go back to 1980 two years before the dawn of the great bull market. Suppose you invested $10,000 in the following 10 stocks on December 22, 1980, and held them until October 4, 1983. That's strategy A. Strategy B is the same, except that you added an 11th stock, Stop and Shop, which turned out to be the 10 beggar. Under the current system, a stock isn't truly attractive until a number of large institutions have recognized its suitability and an equal number of respected Wall Street analysts, the researchers who track the various industries and companies, have put it on the recommended list. With so many people waiting for others to make the first move, it's amazing that anything gets bought. Yes, I know that the price fell nearly in half, to $5 a share in 1984, but the company was still doing well so that gave investors another chance to buy in. As I'll explain in later chapters, if a stock is down but the fundamentals are positive, it's best to hold on and even better to buy more. It wasn't until 1985, with the stock back up to $15, that analysts joined the celebration. In fact, they were falling all over one another to put the limited on their buy lists, and aggressive institutional buying helped send the shares on a ride all the way up to $5.27-8A way beyond what the fundamentals would have justified. By then, there were more than 30 analysts on the trail, 37 as of this writing, and many had arrived just in time to see the limited drop off the edge. By definition, then, the pension portfolios are wedded to the 10% gainers, the plotters, and the regular Fortune 500 bigs hots that offer few pleasant surprises. They almost have to buy the IBMs, the Xeroxes, and the Chryslers, but they'll probably wait to buy Chrysler until it's fully recovered and priced accordingly. The well-respected and highly competent money management firm of Scudder, Stevens, and Clark stopped covering Chrysler altogether right before the bottom, $31-2 and didn't resume coverage until the stock hit $30. Long-term T-bonds are the best way to play interest rates because they aren't callable A or at least not until five years prior to maturity. As many disgruntled bond investors have discovered, many corporate and municipal bonds are callable much sooner, which means the debtors buy them back the minute it's advantageous to do so. Bondholders have no more choice in the matter than property owners who face a condemnation. As soon as interest rates begin to fall, 
causing bond investors to realize they've struck a shrewd bargain, the deal is cancelled and they get their money back in the mail. On the other hand, if interest rates go in a direction that works against the bondholders, the bondholders are stuck with the bonds. Buy the right stocks at the wrong price at the wrong time and you'll suffer great losses. Look what happened in the 1972A74 market break, when conservative issues such as Bristol Myers fell from $9 to $4, Teledyne from $11 to $3, and McDonald's from $15 to $4. These aren't exactly fly-by-night companies. Buy the wrong stocks at the right time and you'll suffer more of the same. During certain periods it seems to take forever for the theoretical 9.8% annual gain from stocks to show up in practice. The Dow Jones Industrials reached an all-time high of 995.15 in 1966 and bounced along below that point until 1972. In turn, the high of 1972A73 wasn't exceeded until 1982. How much did I make from all this? Zippo I didn't buy a single share of any of the financial services companies, not Dreyfus, not Federated, not Franklin. I missed the whole deal and didn't realize it until it was too late. I guess I was too busy thinking about Union Oil of California, just like the doctors. Growth companies that can't stand prosperity foolishly do worse and fall out of favor, which makes them into turnarounds. A fast grower such as Holiday Inn inevitably slows down and the stock is depressed until some smart investors realize that it owns so much real estate that it's a great asset play. Look what's happened to retailers such as Federated and Allied Storsa because of the department stores they build in prime locations, and because of the shopping centers they own, they've been taken over for their assets. McDonald's is a classic fast grower, but because of the thousands of outlets it either owns or is repurchasing from the franchisees, it could be a great future asset play in real estate. You might have assumed it's the sophisticated and high-level gossip that experts hear around the quatrain machines that gives us our best investment ideas, but I get many of mine the way the fireman got his. I talk to hundreds of companies a year and spend hour after hour in heady powwows with CEOs, financial analysts and my colleagues in the mutual fund business, but I stumble onto the big winners in extracurricular situations, the same way you could. Haynes already sold its regular brand of stockings in the department stores and the specialty stores. However, the company had determined that women customarily visit one or the other every six weeks, on average, whereas they go to the grocery store twice a week, which gives them 12 chances to buy legs for every one chance to buy the regular brand. Selling stockings in the grocery store was an immensely popular idea. You could have figured that out by seeing the number of women with plastic eggs in their grocery carts at the checkout counter. You could just imagine how many legs were going to be sold nationwide, after the word got out. All this can't be pure coincidence, thinks Houndstooth. He is soon convinced that putting $3,000 of his hard-earned money into Winchester is a very clever idea. After all, he's done the research. My portfolio continued to grow to the point that I once owned 150 S&L stocks alone. Instead of settling for a couple of savings and loans, I bought them across the board, after determining, of course, that each was a promising investment in itself. It wasn't enough to invest in one convenience store. Along with Southland, the parent company at 7-Eleven, I couldn't resist buying Circle K, National Convenience, Shop and Go, Hop in Foods, Fairmont Foods, and Sunshine Jr., to mention a few. Buying hundreds of stocks certainly wasn't Ned Johnson's idea of how to run an equity fund, but I'm still here. You won't find many well-scrubbed adolescents in our ranks. My wife once did some research into the popular theory that great inventions and great ideas come to people before they reach 30. On the other hand, since I'm now 45 and still running Fidelity Magellan, I'm eager to report that great investing has nothing to do with youthy and that the middle-aged investor who has lived through several kinds of markets may have an advantage over the youngster who hasn't. My own boss, Ned Johnson, took the idea a thought further and added the check-writing feature. Prior to that, the money market was most useful as a place where small corporations could park their weekly payroll funds. 
the check writing feature gave the money market fund universal appeal as a savings account and a checking account. It's not easy to compile lists of failed turnarounds except from memory, because their existence is wiped out of the S&P books, the chart books, and the stockbroker's records, and these companies are never heard from again. I could attempt to reconstruct the rather long list of the failed turnarounds I wish I hadn't bought, except the mere idea of it gives me a headache. Better than boring alone is a stock that's boring and disgusting at the same time. Something that makes people shrug, wretch, or turn away in disgust is ideal. Take safety clean. That's a name with promise to begin with the any company that uses AK where there ought to be AC is worth investigating. The fact that safety clean was once related to Chicago Rawhide is also favorable, see it's a spin-off later in this chapter. Taco Bell, I was impressed with the burrito on a trip to California, La Quinta Motor Inns, somebody at the rival Holiday Inn told me about it, Volvo, my family and friends drive this car, Apple computer, my kids had one at home and then the systems manager bought several for the office, Service Corporation International a Fidelity Electronics analyst, who had nothing to do with funeral homes, so this wasn't his field, found on a trip to Texas, Dunkin' Donuts, I loved the coffee, and recently. The revamped Pier 1 Imports, recommended by my wife. In fact, Carolyn is one of my best sources. She's the one who discovered legs. And how about Coleco? Just because the Cabbage Patch doll was the best-selling toy of this century, it couldn't save a mediocre company with a bad balance sheet, and although the stock rose dramatically for a year or so, spurred on first by home video games and then by the Cabbage Patch enthusiasm, eventually it dropped from a high of $65 in 1983 to a recent $13-4 as the company went into Chapter 11, filing for bankruptcy in 1988. As for Will Rogers, he may have given the best bit of advice ever uttered about stocks, don't gamble. Take all your savings and buy some good stock and hold it till it goes up, then sell it. If it don't go up, don't buy it. Of course, not all professionals are oxymoronic. There are great fund managers, innovative fund managers, and maverick fund managers who invest as they please. John Templeton is one of the best. He is a pioneer in the global market, one of the first to make money all around the world. His shareholders avoided the 1972A74 collapse in the U.S. because he had cleverly placed most of his fund's assets in Canadian and Japanese stocks. Not only that, he was one of the first to take advantage of the fact that the Japanese Dow Jones, the Nikkei average, is up 17-fold from 1966 to 1988, while the U.S. Dow Jones has only doubled. There's a logical explanation for this. In stocks you've got the company's growth on your side. You're a partner in a prosperous and expanding business. In bonds, you're nothing more than the nearest source of spare change. When you lend money to somebody, the best you can hope for is to get it back, plus interest. What else explains the fact that large numbers of investors, including CEOs and sophisticated business people, have been most afraid of stocks during the precise periods when stocks have done their best? i.e., from the mid-1930s to the late 1960s, while being least afraid precisely when stocks have done their worst, i.e., early 1970s and recently in the fall of 1987. Does the success of Ravi Batra's book The Great Depression of 1990 almost guarantee a great national prosperity? Perhaps a winning investment seems so unlikely in the first place that people can best imagine it happening as far away as possible somewhere off in the great beyond, just as we all imagine that perfect behavior takes place in heaven and not on earth. Therefore the doctor who understands the ethical drug business inside out is more comfortable investing in Schlumberger, an oil service company about which he knows nothing, while the managers of Schlumberger are likely to own Johnson & Johnson or American Home Products. For some reason the whole business of analyzing stocks has been made to seem so esoteric and technical that normally careful consumers invest their life savings on a whim. The same couple that spends the weekend searching for the best deal on airfares to London buys 500 shares of KLM without having spent five minutes learning about the company. Let's go back to the hound's teeth. They fancy themselves to be smart consumers, 
even going so far as to read the labels on pillowcases. They compare the weights and prices on the boxes of laundry soap to find the best buy. They calculate the watts per lumen of competing light bulbs, but all of their savings are dwarfed by houndstooth's fiascos in the stock market. But automatic data processing isn't as boring as Bob Evans Farms. What could be duller than a stock named Bob Evans? It puts you to sleep just thinking about it, which is one reason it's been such a great prospect. But even Bob Evans Farms won't win the prize for the best name you could give to a stock, and neither will Shoney's or Crown, Cork, and Seal. None of these has a chance against Pep Boysa Manny, Mo, and Jack. To top it off, you get big tax breaks from depreciating your earth movers and rock crushers, plus you get a mineral depletion allowance, the same as Exxon and Atlantic Richfield get for their own oil and gas deposits. I can't imagine anyone's going bankrupt over a rock pit. So if you can't run your own rock pit, the next best thing is buying shares in aggregate producing companies such as Vulcan Materials, Calmat, Boston Sand and Gravel, Dravo, and Florida Rock. When larger companies such as Martin Marietta, General Dynamics or Ashland sell off various parts of their businesses, they always keep the rock pits. Buying back shares is the simplest and best way a company can reward its investors. If a company has faith in its own future, then why shouldn't it invest in itself, just as the shareholders do? The announcement of massive share buybacks by company after company broke on October 20, 1987 the fall of many stocks, and stabilized the market at the height of its panic. Long term, these buybacks can't help but reward investors.